There it is. It's too loud. I can hear it. Rick, 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 remix. Yeah. <laughs> welcome in. Welcome in. Welcome in. Konnichiwa. Bienvenidos. Aloha and hello. You are now listening. This is DOS Process, the show wherein we examine how who we are becomes what we do. My name is Mac Aston, and I'll be your host this afternoon. It is a lovely Saturday in Southern California. I'm not sure where you are, but it's probably not a lovely Saturday in Southern California. Unless, of course, <laughs> you're in Southern California. There's a few folks in Southern California who are here that make the show go. It is the crack staff of Nair Goodnix. Nair Goodnix? Close yeah, Nair Goodnix and Never Do Wells. <laughs> Sitting across from me is a man for whom no introduction is what he'll get. Mike Faso. <laughs> That's me. Hi, Mike. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Yeah, good. I had a uh, pinched nerve in my neck. Tell me about it. Yeah, it hurt. It hurt. I woke up with a horrible stiff neck probably like three weeks ago. Shit. I could barely move my head. Gradually, that went away. But then I had this burning pain in my neck, and it would go right down my arm. Yikes. So I went to the doctor, and he's like, you got to get this contraption called a cervical, home cervical traction unit. What? And it is like this medieval device that you have to put like a collar on your head, and then you hang this pull you over the door, and you put a bag of water, and it just kind of pulls your head up. I, have you been using it? I have not. Have you purchased one? I did. It's sitting in the house. It is sitting in the house. In the box? box. Yes. <laughs> I'm, a little, I'm a little nervous about it. just because. Was the, the box heavy to pick up? No, it wasn't. Okay. It was very light. I'm like... <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> but, it's bad for the neck. But right? the, uh, the picture on it, I'm like, this guy does not look comfortable. That's crazy. And my wife is afraid it's going to pull my head off. Well, uh, yeah, because that's her job. <laughs> yeah. The man of the ones and twos, the man sliding things up and down, turning all of our knobs, making a sound as good as we sound. American hero Colin Crump. Colin. Hey. What up, dog? What up, G? You chilling? Oh, I'm chilling. Are you, are you keeping it real? Keeping it as real as I can. That's important. Yeah. That's important. That's important. <laughs> it's important. How These fun. days and times. It's, it's true. It's true. You know, I can get, I'm, get as real as I can, you know? That's, there's no other way to be. How was lunch? It was delicious. We had some great Mediterranean food come in from some mystery deliverer. All of a sudden, there was big bags of food. It was amazing. It was it was, it was a magician uh, it brought food. It was like a instead of a disappearing rabbit, it was appearing <laughs> appearing Mediterranean. A lot better. And the man sitting to Colin's left and across from me, totally off camera, the man wearing a blue ball cap and some lovely Ray Ban glasses, <laughs> the creator, the guider, the man who made this all happen, the man from from whose brain stem sprung DOS process, Dan Levy. Hello. How's it going, Dan? It's going so good. Look, I even took the mic out of the microphone stand. You're like a stand-up comic sitting down. <laughs> this is the best. Oh, I almost said I'm like Mark Maron. That's other people's jobs. I don't God understand it. it. People say you look like Mark Maron. Well, Marin. okay, when I grow the beard out, well, now it's kind of grown out, but when I do the mustache... Apparently, I look like Mark Marin, and I run in a comedy circle, even though I'm not a comedian. Right. And the, my comic friends, amongst other friends of mine, will point out that I look somewhat like Mark Marin. Here's what you do. <laughs> Here's exactly what you do. You 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 figure you put the the Mark Marin mustache back on. Right. And then you start a stand-up career <clears throat> under the name Mark Marion. Ah, and watch genius. the checks come in. Yes, very nice. Very I was nice. thinking about just doing stand up and just using my name Dan Levy because that that cat seems to be the There's other Dan, Dan Levy. The other Dan Levy. The other Dan Levy's doing pretty well. He's on Whitney. He's got some things going. I Fantastic. mean, why not just write off the name I already have? <laughs> and the checks will come flowing in. Right. <laughs> Perfect. Today's guest is one of those guys that when you look up on the internet, especially in particular the IMDB page, from which I will be quoting very, very soon, <laughs> you think, holy shit, where does he find the time? He's got, <clears throat> he's got a list of credits on here, and it's not just the credits for the individual shows, but it's the different jobs he's done. From the animation department, 17 titles. From special effects, 6 titles. Second unit director, assistant director, 2 titles. Director, 3 titles. Editor, 3 titles. Actor, 2 titles. Writer, producer, miscellaneous crew, art department, production manager, sound department, makeup department. A man of uh, many, many hats, the best of which uh, is on his head right now. Wow. Uh, I'm I'm uh, Peter Le Pete Levin. Welcome hey, to the show. Hey, Pete. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks, thanks for joining for us. I must uh, admit, I was thrilled when you walked in the house because uh, you you brought a Baltimore Oriole bird. 
mm-hmm. uh, with uh, a foam finger and a pennant that I think you guys uh, made. Uh, yes, in, yes. Uh, not too long ago. And a nose hat. Uh, as I told you off the air, my wife is from Baltimore. My father's from Baltimore. They uh, well, my father still lives there. My wife, uh, thankfully, is out here with me because. <laughs> If she wasn't, it'd be weird. <laughs> uh, but I, it was—it was great to see uh, some familiarity there. Yeah, I have the—I uh, have the Baltimore pride. I, uh, I definitely flaunt my uh, Baltimoreness. As well, you should. It is—it uh, is truly charm city. I had the good fortune to live there for a couple of years, a few years back, and found it to be exactly as advertised: the greatest city in America, the yes. city that reads. <laughs> this is uh, what it says on some of the bus benches. <laughs> former <laughs> former mottos of Baltimore. My old man did an interview for Baltimore Magazine uh, a few years back, and uh, one of the last questions was, if Baltimore had a motto, what would it be? And I think you'll get this. He said, after much consternation, all of humanity has greatness within, but we need pitching. <laughs> right. <laughs> and thankfully, that pitching has shown up. Uh, yeah, over here the past and there. Couple of years. Yeah. Those are doing all right. They're doing all right. They could still use uh, maybe another starter, starting pitcher or two. Um, I think there's a few extras on the Dodgers. Would you guys like to work out yes. a trade? Yeah, I don't uh, know if we could afford them. But, uh, how how yeah. much for Adam Jones? Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> Adam Jones, he's got to stick around. Oh, man, that guy's so good. Yeah. So good. It's it's funny, uh, and w- I'll get off the baseball in just a second, but uh, he, a couple years ago I realized that he was sort of on the same track as Matt Kemp, mm. where it was there were some mistakes thrown to the wrong bases, uh, tremendous talent, uh, but when he put it together it was going to be off the charts, and that putting it together has taken place over the last couple of years. I think there's some intangibles with him also, like the way like you know we have this, this rookie pitcher, Kevin Gaussman, who shows up in spring training, and he likes to eat donuts, and Adam Jones filled his entire locker with, just hundreds of donuts. Fantastic. Um, I hadn't heard that story. He just like he's a he seems like a genuinely nice guy who has fun doing what he's doing. Right. I don't know. Good chemistry guy. There was a picture yeah. of him. Was it at? I think it was at the Super Bowl. Right after the yeah, the Ravens yeah. won the Super Bowl, and he's you know up uh, in the front row of fans like uh, like you see the guys do after they score a touchdown, and there was just so much love in his face. Yeah, he's he's actually a San Diego guy, huh. um, but he's just really kind of taken being a part of the community in Baltimore to heart and uh, just I mean you really like to see that with local sports Hell figures yeah. when they, they don't just feel like a gun for hire they seem like they they care about the people in the community and all Ryan, that. they love where they are yeah. yeah he's he's the perfect guy for that okay I'm gonna go I, stri- I could talk about this for like we'll get back two to hours it. Trust yeah. me, we'll okay. get back to it I'm gonna go straight to the IMD page DB page and ask the question I'm sure everybody asks first tell me about your appearance in major League two Oh man, uh, <laughs> that's one of those things where when I first got an IMDB page, I was like, "Oh, I gotta, I gotta enter this in." Uh, I was just an extra. You can see me um, in the shot where Willie Mays Hayes hits a home run. Spoiler alert! Um, <laughs> I'm a little blue blob with big hair, uh, but I can point myself out in the movie. Um, they used Oriole Park because Jacobs Field for the Indians wasn't ready yet. Uh, Oriole Park at Camden Yard. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And that's uh, so. When did they shoot that? It was probably. Let's see. It's the release says ninety four. So that sounds about right. Yeah. Ninety three. They must have been shooting it. I, I don't know if we're ever gonna get off baseball. <laughs> right. Podcast. Yeah. Um, I was actually at the last opening day, uh, at um. Oh my God! Memorial Park, Memorial Stadium. Memorial Stadium. Stadium yeah. yeah, it was. Uh, I my dad went to Hopkins and uh, now teaches there, and so I applied to Hopkins and then uh, got in, but didn't go. But I went back to visit uh, for a second because I'd made friends with the admissions guy, <laughs> and uh, and we uh, walked from his apartment down to Memorial Stadium for the final opening day. Uh, yeah. And I was less than twenty one, but I will say this: I had a good time in the bleachers. <laughs> yeah. And they won, and they won, yeah. which is a good game. Good game. What? We're still talking baseball. We are. Right. It's, it'll, it'll come back. All right, fair enough. Uh, the next question, which I'm sure is the second question you always get okay. from people who look at your IMDb page. Tell me about the game show lingo. Oh, uh, the game show lingo. Yeah, that was... Uh, well, when I came out to L.A., I thought either I'm going to have a job, you know, creating, you know, with really... Uh, amazing collaborations with other creative people and, you know, just like living the dream or I'm going to be a professional game show contestant and just cynically try to make as much money in a single sitting as possible. Um, this is something that you knew you'd be good at. Well, here's the thing. is, is um, Do you want a spoiler on Lingo to see if I won or not? Uh, or, when did it air? 2003? 2003. Yeah. So it's 10 years it's, out. Yeah, that, I think that, that exceeds the statute of limitations, right? Could you, okay. could you tell the story without revealing the ending until the ending? Uh, oh man, I don't know how much of a story there is. I, I will tell you this: the studio audience 
does not exist. <gasps> uh, it's all dubbed in later. Lies. No, it's not. So, yeah, I'm Lies. sorry. No. Um, Why do they do that to us? But I got to be Chuck Woolery. That's That's pretty good. Yeah. That is pretty Um, good. And then after the show, we did, like, little, like, talk and shake hands, like, where nobody can hear what you're saying, and he's like... Oh, shit. Oh, well, what? no, no, actually it was during the show he, he he asked me, like, a little bit of something about myself, and I told him, like, oh, yeah, I just got back from going across the Sahara Desert with a nomad and a camel, and he's like, what? And <laughs> I realized, like, oh, yeah, I probably, like, shouldn't have picked something so weird. Mm. Um, um, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What <laughs> right, right. were you doing in the Sahara? You see, we're gonna go go down a rabbit let's, hole. No, let's go back there, man. Okay. We got an hour. Let's go the hell back there. Oh man, that was when I was living in New York. Before I moved to LA, I was working at this post house, and um, <laughs> it was a great job. Um, but uh, I was sitting in front of the computer all day. It was that New York humidity, and you just you want to get out. Yeah, yeah you schwitz. Uh, and. Uh, so I just went to the travel part of the bookstore and looked at all the pictures, and I was like, Morocco, that's where I want to go. And <laughs> Are you fucking nuts? So yeah, from I just, the, the New York just by community. myself with like a backpack <laughs> went to Morocco that summer. Wow, for how long? Um, a couple weeks. Okay. And some somebody just met me in the street, and he's like, hey, my cousin has a thing where you can go through the Sahara. Uh, and I was like, okay. And I'm sure it wasn't his cousin. But uh, I went, and I survived. I was... Literally the dirtiest I've ever been in my life. Um, my nose was bleeding because it was so dry out. Holy shit! And it was like caked to the front of my yeah, shirt, yeah. like just like sweat, like you know, uh, it was it was really gross. And that actually led to the best shower I've ever taken. Uh, <laughs> it was where, amazing. Where uh, where was the? It was at a hotel. Uh, yeah, I think I got stuck in uh, Tangier uh, afterwards, and uh, I, I had wanted to like go back up to Spain and. Uh, I got stuck there, and I was just like, "Screw it!" You know, I'm just—I have no money. I'm a backpacker, but tonight I'm putting a hotel on the credit yes. card, and I'm taking a really nice shower. Yes. And that was one of the most transcendent moments of the trip. Actually, was the hotel shower. <laughs> That's so funny. That's like—it's like that scene in *Defending Your Life* when he doesn't, when he, uh, when Albert Brooks decides he doesn't want to sit, uh, you know, on the cross uh, Atlantic flight uh, in in between two people, and so he's he's got oh. like nine thousand bucks left to his name, and he goes ahead and, and spends a thousand of it on the first class ticket. Yeah. Or maybe 2000 on the first class ticket. And <clears throat> they look at that later on as to say that was one of the best decisions you made. <laughs> I, went, I was at Bonnaroo in 2006 or seven, and the fact that I can't remember it uh, will give you some indication <laughs> as to what Bonnaroo <laughs> is like. Uh, and that was a dirty fucking place. It wasn't the Sahara by far, uh, but the shower afterwards was transcendent indeed. I, yeah. I can kind of get that. It's nice uh, to clean off all that dirt after a while. You mentioned at the uh, at the I think it was, uh, when I first asked about the the lingo show uh, that you had the intention of coming out uh, to Los Angeles and working and collaborating uh, creatively mm-hmm. uh, with a bunch of different people. I figured that's a pretty good time to bring up something that I believe is going on, including Mr. Dan Levy. Oh yes, here uh, something creative, a collaboration referred to as or known as I'm Scared the Movie dot com mm-hmm. or I'm Scared the Movie. Dot com. What? <laughs> What's that all about? Um, well, this is something Dan has this amazing talent of just finding cool people. Oh, um, and this actually, Greg was actually somebody that uh, our art director, Robin, first met. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Greg Simpkins, uh, also known as Crayola. Yes, one of the baddest ass badasses uh, in the art world. Yeah, uh, and he, also just so nice. Such I mean, a good guy. the dude is so talented, but also so humble and pleasant, and just like, I don't know. I mean, just it, I, I just want to keep on working with him on everything. I did. Uh, but uh, yeah, and he's just this amazing artist who um, has actually been influenced a lot by. Stop motion. He told that to me, and I was like, oh, that's a nice thing to say. But then I started looking at his paintings, and I was like, oh, yeah, there's the elephant from the Island of Misfit Toys. Wow, interesting. Um, so it's actually a really good match. Um, so what we're doing is, is we're going to try to make a short film where we translate Greg's art into stop motion animation. Fantastic. There's a Kickstarter page out there if anybody's listening and would like to, um, well, check it out. Uh, you uh, go to Kickstarter, and what do you put in, Dan? Uh, just put in I'm scared, and you'll find it. Perfect. Perfect. I just wanted to get that out there yeah. early. Now Thank I'm gonna. I've, I've, we went from the past uh, to the present, and now we're gonna go back into the past a little okay. bit. Okay. When did you come out to LA? Uh, let's see. February 2002. 
Very good. Yeah. Don't worry, there's a lot of twos there. Two, yes, two, yeah. oh, oh, two. Uh, and, and what were you doing when you first got out here? Uh, Where'd you live when you first got out? I here? lived um, near uh, Pico and uh, Crescent Heights, basically. Sure. Yeah, that's where I live, actually. Okay. What street? Uh, I was on Stearns, Stearns, Stearns Drive. Uh, well, we're on Elvira. Okay. Yeah, it's right yeah, there. Yeah. Right there. We're following each other or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and what were you doing when you first got out? Mostly just sleeping on the couch there. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> wow, that was a good one. It was so good. He <laughs> laughed his headphones off. But so uh, yeah, I mean, there were several months of just sort of finding my bearings. You know, I came out with a one-way ticket from New York. Ballsy. Uh, and I didn't know if I was going to be here two weeks or two years or 20 years. Um, but I figured if I wanted to know film industry and entertainment in general, that like I should at least understand L.A., even if I wasn't going to stay here. Smart. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think my first job was actually working at a special effects shop uh, for this guy, Tony Gardner. He mm -hmm. does uh, Alterian and uh, helped um, put the fur on an animatronic lion. That's That sounds like kind of a bitching job. It was really fun. I mean, I was just like sort of an assistant there, but uh, I definitely... Got my hands dirty, and they let me help out with some of the creative stuff, and you know, perfect. Yeah. And did that lead uh, into the next uh, job? As 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 this town seems to work a lot of times. Um, not not so directly, but it would it definitely led into other jobs in unexpected ways later. You know, like somebody I worked with there, you know, ten years later, re recommended me for a stop motion job. Perfect. Uh, so, you know, you never sort of know how things are going to come back around in this town. That's true. And it's kind of a fun thing, like, experiencing it. Like, oh, right. That guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he was terrific. He did this thing. I think he'd be perfect for this. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of work happens just that way. It, it is uh, it is a, a large town in terms of surface area, but uh, not so big uh, when it comes to uh, the creative uh, process. I'm working on another project right now where uh, it's 2D animation, and the guy I got to do the backgrounds on it... Uh, was a former roommate of mine, and he just happens to know the woman that we hired to be the animator. Boom. And it's like, oh, hey, you guys are collaborating, and you didn't even know it. It's perfect. Like you're friends already. Yeah, see, yeah. it's a tiny town. Yeah. Well, this ties right into how we got started with I'm Scared, and I know this sounds like a shameless plug, and it's not, no, but there's it's, no a, it's a good story. Tell us, Dan. Um, I mean, Pete and I worked together on Robot Chicken. Um, when I first got in, I spent my first day with Pete, and it was amazing. We got along great, and I think probably well into working on that, and about five years ago, I said, we should do stop motion with all these contemporary artists that I'm friendly with. And I was like, yeah, great, let's do it. And then, you know, kind of is just a great idea. So then five years later, I'm just killing myself working for the man. And, uh, night and day. oh my goodness. So I, there was an opportunity to work on something live action that Pete was directing. And I said, yeah, I want to help out. Like live action is great. I don't want to dip my toe back into that. And Pete directed this great short series that's on YouTube called Just Shut Up mm -hmm. with uh, Smosh and YouTube. And I spent four amazing days on set with Pete as a director, and we had a great time. And I said, we, we've got to do this. We've got to make this thing happen. And now we're here we are with this Kickstarter. Um, and like Pete had said with Robin, um, Robin had been a friend of Greg's. We both had worked with Robin. And it's just another instance in this town where everything connects at the right time with the right people. And, you know, knock on uh, my MacBook, we'll uh, be able to make this project. There wow, it goes. he so actually knocked on that but too hard. <laughs> yeah, too hard. Isn't it on top of some wood? <laughs> it's actually on top of some IKEA, so it's particle board. <laughs> <laughs> knock on particle board. Uh, it is, yeah. This town, uh, this town is like that, and there's, you know, it, it, oftentimes there's uh, a little reminder that the universe knows exactly what it's doing. Did you always want to work in stop motion animation? Was it was it when you were a little kid? Where there was there something that inspired you? And uh, well, originally I wanted to be an inventor like in uh, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> right. uh, and then after that, I wanted to... I was a really big fan of Garfield and comic strips, and I totally. wanted to just like, draw comic <laughs> the, strips. The, the strip, strip or, the, or, the, car, or the, the, the animated cartoon? Um, the strip first, and yeah. then the animated cartoon. Um, and then uh, I actually have a letter from when I was a real little kid uh, from Jim Davis, the creator, oh, no saying shit. that uh, he liked my cartoons that I'd sent him. Oh, Get the what the what? Very yeah, nice. yeah. You, I hope that's framed somewhere. It is. It's it's back in my house in Baltimore on the wall. That's um, fantastic. What you 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 were a fan of the comics and you decided to write uh, yeah. a letter to him. How old were you? Oh gosh, probably like nine years old oh, at the time. Man. Saying I love. What would you say? Been 
oh, I don't remember. I think I just I said I love Garfield, and here's some of my drawings of cartoons. <laughs> and, you know, it started off with me, like, drawing fake movie posters for movies that were in my head. Beautiful. And then I got into the idea of film, and then I went to film school. And then after all the live-action stuff, I circled back around again to cartoons and animation again. Um, that's fantastic. Uh, where'd you go to uh, undergraduate? Uh, NYU. Very nice. I've, I've heard of it. That's yeah, in, in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it not? Uh, is it a competitive school? Um, I think it's, I mean, the sort of, uh, I don't know, stock answer is it's what you make of it. I Fair mean, enough. I think just like L.A., it's, it's about who you surround yourself with. And if you surround yourself with people who support each other, and uh, you know, creatively, and and are, are like rooting for each other. Yeah, I think that's the key. And and I mean, that's been the key throughout my career. I've I've always you know, sort of gone by like I'd rather have a friend who happens to be a connection and a connection who happens to be a friend. I like that. Yeah, that's a, that's that's a nice way to put it. So. <clears throat> Uh, you, you get a little work at a, a special effects house um, uh, back in 2002. Mm -hmm. The next job after that here in uh, Los Angeles? Oh, boy. Let's see. Uh, no pressure. No pressure. I helped manage a school for a stand-up comedian. Manage a school? Uh, it was a uh, comedy school. Ah, comedy okay. School. Very good. Very yeah. nice. Very nice. I bet that was a lot of laughs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Oh, <laughs> really sorry. <laughs> Let's just start the whole show over again. <laughs> Play that, that intro music. That was that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Real sorry. How long did you do that? Uh, I think about six months. Right. Uh, I mean, this is like, I don't know. After that, I, I helped manage a, uh, a magic theater Ooh, in Santa Monica. Very cool. exciting. Um, <laughs> There's been a lot of weird jobs. No, in those there. are good though. Those are the ones that you know that add to the, the quiver. Character building. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. No, not just not just on the holster. Those are Steve Martin style jobs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. all the way. Yeah. Um, and, and then when when did you get started with uh, with uh, these knuckleheads on the robot chicken? Um. Well, actually, uh, was that that wasn't first out of the box. Was it? It was close to first out of the box. Eh? Yeah. You guys interviewed uh, Mark uh, Caballero. Ooh, uh, yeah. I don't even want to talk about him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that guy. He yeah, was great. super sweet guy. Yeah. Uh, him and the screen novelties actually gave me my first job in stop motion. Boom. Um, and uh, I worked with them on Drew Carey's green screen show. And from there, they're like, hey, uh, we don't know if this is cool, but we put your name in for an assistant animator on this Seth Green TV show. We Beautiful. hope you don't mind. And I was like, don't mind. Like, <laughs> yes, yeah, please. count me in. So you've been there stem to stern with Robot Chicken. Um, I was on seasons one and two, and then I came back last year for season six. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. What were you doing in between? Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, things I can't talk about. Uh, <laughs> okay. Some time in the uh, in the pokey. Sure, um, sure. <laughs> no, I mean just no, different it, jobs. It happens you know. through every windows. one of us. Every yeah. one of us. Now the pokey, that's the same as the hoose gal. Yes, uh, yes, similar. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Um, <clears throat> well, where'd I go? <laughs> I, just, I was thinking about the You're right cow. there in the corner of my living room. <laughs> honestly, I was thinking about the hoose cow first. <laughs> You're like, oh, God, the hoose cow. Oh, and I guess you were uh, stuck with these guys on Moral or Moral Oral as well, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I was on the first two seasons of that. That's and, a crazy, uh, crazy. Okay, I hate show. to put you on the spot. We worked on both, which was more fun. Oh, you know, the cool thing about those shows is they're, they were so different. Mm -hmm. um, Robot Chicken was all about a new challenge every day, animating something with, like, a puppet or a toy that, wasn't necessarily supposed to be animated with, making them do something, and it's kind of stretching the bounds. And then Moral Oral was all about character development over time. And I really like that, too. You know, I mean, it's just like, you know, it's 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 apples and oranges, I think, you yeah, know. It, just, re it really is. Yeah. Like, I, I got a chance to watch some, uh, to revisit uh, season one of Moral Oral, and it's yeah. so good. The writing is so well yeah, done. Dino is so deep and disturbed. <laughs> A talented, talented man, nonetheless. Yeah, no, it's it's a lot of fun to to work on that stuff, and just I mean, to one of the first animation jobs I get right out the gate for it to actually be a successful thing. I mean, I remember all these veteran animators coming up to me at the time saying like, "This doesn't happen," nice. you know. So, just feel like I I got really lucky with that, and uh, I think it was it was lucky that we had so many talented people in one space, a lot of whom are still working together and, and you know, a couple of different studios have all kind of blossomed out of that original project now. That's a wonderful thing when it happens. You know, you get, you get uh, call it luck of the draw or the universe knows exactly what it's doing, but you get a bunch of creative people together that know 
what they're doing and from that <clears throat> you know the creativity just grows and grows and grows and grows and you know like there's offshoots of it now and, and I would imagine you know that in the offshoots there are y y people that were in the same position that you were in you know uh, young and looking to get involved and wanting to contribute and from that even more will grow it's nice how that stuff works circle of life Oh, well, that's not really a circle. It's more of a tree branching. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> but, well, eventually we're all going to die. So. Well, that yeah, yeah, well, comes then, back to the ground. That's yeah. it. That's it. Everybody dies. <laughs> all right. <laughs> thanks for thanks well, for joining us. The me. eternal <laughs> optimist, Mike Fasolo, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, that's so good. That's hysterical. <laughs> What's this uh, <clears throat> assistant director stuff on here? Oh, you know, it's it's just like another thing, like. Uh, each one of these jobs is like it feels like it's engaging in a different part of the brain. An assistant director, it's like uh, those. It's it's more straight up like uh, organizational skills right. and like sort of like planning to go into a battle. Right. And I really love the coordinator and uh, assistant directing jobs I've had. Um, but at the same time, it's just like I kind of knew that if I kept on going down that road, that would be all I was doing. Uh -huh. And I, de I definitely wanted to get into stuff where I was more of a creative voice in it instead of just somebody who was organizing things. Mm -hmm. um, not that that's not creative. No, I mean, there's, it's like, yeah, you have to have some creativity in order to get... Yeah, it's a different stuff. kind of creativity. Like, you right. know, it's like packing the trunk of your car before like a long vacation or playing Tetris, just like getting everything in the right place. Exactly, and, yeah. exactly. There's a part of me that absolutely um, just... Uh, I, I get off on that sort of logistical know-how, yeah. you know, making sure everything is in the right spot. There's an old, uh, you know, and, and assistant directing is, is slightly different in in, uh, in uh, live action uh, stuff than it is, I, I would imagine, in, you know, stop motion, but um, still, <clears throat> you got to know what the hell you're doing, yeah. and that is key, and that is key. Yeah, and you don't seem to have a preference, yeah? Uh, for? Whether you, uh, yeah, well, I, I You mean live action versus animation? Yeah. Or? Um, I think, you know, it, it's sort of like, there's there's a, a lot of animators who say they don't want animation to be defined as a genre. Within mm -hmm. animation, you have comedy and tragedy and all that. Very good. It's a tool to tell the story, and some stories are better told with animation. Some stories are better told with live action, um, and some stories are better told with different types of animation. And uh, you know, I think that it should be viewed as a storytelling tool. And the in the end of the day, it's like the story is the most important thing. Indeed. Tell me the story of Heinz Sunny Side Up. Oh man! Uh, is this a good thing or a bad thing? I, it was. It was mostly a good thing. Okay. It was. It was my first um, animation out of my garage studio. Wow! Which actually your garage? I, actually, my garage, and I'm still doing it to this day. Fucking hell. Um, right on. It's sort of one of these things where in LA, I sort of I, I realized pretty quickly that I can't just depend on other people to get me work because mm. it's not going to be a steady job. I'm never going to be at the same <clears throat> place for 50 years and get a gold watch. Um, <laughs> so it's like about being proactive and finding the work yourself. And uh, this was a, uh, a contest that this this uh, studio had won to make a stop motion video for. Um, it was I feel like that was kind of the early days of uh, like... Uh, Contest where you create the commercial for the company, right? Yeah, um, which is kind of a funny thing um, in some ways, I believe, because th th they're asking you to do the hardcore creative work, yeah, which uh, saves them uh, having to pay you. you yeah, well, I mean? like, yeah. Well, eventually, if, I guess if you if you win, there's some sort of remuneration, but it saves them a lot of fucking dirty work. It does, and it, and and posing it as a competition can get you know a lot of people who are creative uh, but not far enough uh, up on the ladder to get noticed to get noticed. That, that being said, I have a friend who has made his living off of these contests. No he kidding. was featured in the New York Times on Jay Leno and like, I mean, he's done it. That's know? fantastic. Enter, entering contests, winning them and uh, and taking the prize money? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to get his story wrong or anything, but I know that like he... We'll just change the name. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you can find it if you look his it up. His name is Tim, um, Tim, Tim. But, uh, no, it's, it's a Tim, fellow named Joel. He's a super nice guy. And uh, he, um, I think what the story is, is, he won a certain amount of money from one contest, invested that into flying to Antarctica, and then recorded a uh, fan-made commercial for Klondike Bar in Antarctica. Genius. And then won that contest. Genius. Genius. Mm. That's, I mean, that's that's good thinking. Yeah. Good but thing. I mean, I, you know, I think I think to survive in this town, if you want to stay a creative person, you have to make your own opportunities. And that Heinz job was the first time where I was just like, you know what? If I'm not working at someone else's studio, I'm just going to make a studio. And oh, it's the studio itself at the time 
was pretty janky. I mean, at this point, I had professional lights and cameras and lenses and stuff like that. At the time, um, I didn't have a high enough tripod, so I actually hot glued a still camera to a ladder. <laughs> Fucking A. Um, and it worked. I, I mean, love it. I love it. It worked. It won the competition. I think it got second place. All right, fair enough. Some, Close enough. Some stupid video of like a two, like, three-year-olds kissing or something one first. Because, mm. you know, that's what people Because, yeah, for. people, people love watching three-year-olds kiss. <laughs> Wait, yeah, I think that, 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 <laughs> that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right at all. <laughs> but it looks terrific. Right. No, it's like that, it's like that, uh, that famous Italian uh, photo. What's it? Il Bacio? Or it's the two little, it's two little Italian kids in, like, the 40s... Uh, Sitting on a stoop, kissing each other. It's right. adorable, right? Il Baccio. Yeah, so this, uh, Il Baccio beat me out for the, uh, the <laughs> right. Heinz commercial. Well, yeah, well, maybe eventually it'll catch on. Right. Bum, ba, dum, ba, dum, bum. Again, let's start the show <laughs> over. <Everybody laughs> oh. back to <laughs> <laughs> right, stop making these terrible, terrible jokes. Um, how often do you get back to Baltimore? Uh, a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be going back with my uh, with my fiance for the last game of the season, the Chris Davis bobblehead night. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. What's he at now, 44, 45? I think 44, yeah. Holy shit. Uh, for those of you Maybe who 45. aren't aware, Chris Davis is a slugger for the Baltimore Orioles who has, as of, uh, what are we, uh... Oh, about a month after the All-Star break, he has uh, slugged 44 home runs uh, for the Baltimore Orioles. He has, at times, carried them and, at other times, been a major contributor to the success that they're having. About four games out? Uh, yeah, I think five and a half five now, and but half. maybe by the end of the day, a little you closer. Never know. You never know. Who's in uh, second place? Uh, the Rays. Okay, they're yeah. tough. We did a number on them for you. We were happy to have the Rays in town. Oh, yeah. The Dodgers. Uh, no, I'm really excited them. that the Dodgers are playing everybody else in the AL East except for the Orioles right. this year because they're perfect. doing well, so well. Oh, well, I guess we had two. I think we had three games. We played the Dodgers when they were still slumping. Right. They were, yeah. yeah they were, and you guys clobbered them. Maybe we won one of the three. Yeah. Thing. And then you guys came out to this coast, but went everywhere but Dodger Stadium. Everywhere but here. Yeah. Right. Which I went is, down to San Diego to see them. Well, how was that stadium? It's good. I, I liked it more the first two times I went there. Okay. Uh, this was the third time I went there, and um, I really like the seating bowl. Uh, but then, like, you go inside where you buy the snacks, it kind of feels a little bit like a shopping mall. Mm. Um, yeah, I get that. I like, I like my baseball just a little bit grittier. Yeah, authentic. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I still prefer it to Anaheim. Uh, agreed, agreed. I Actually, I haven't been there since the makeover, since the most recent makeover. The last time I was there was probably middle... Middle 90s. It feels sort of like manufactured baseball in Anaheim to me. A little bit of uh, Disney, if you will. Yeah, yeah, you know, I like my rowdy drunks at the baseball game. Have you ever been to a game in Milwaukee? No. Oh, my God. <laughs> I went to a game in Milwaukee last summer, and I, I don't drink anymore. I used to uh, drink a lot. Mm -hmm. And so the perspective that I have now is, uh, well, it is what it is. <clears throat> and so uh, we get there uh, early enough. Uh, they have a tailgating uh, section. The parking lot is huge right next to the stadium. And people are there super, super early. Uh, having an incredibly festive time. I mean, the sun was shining perfectly. The barbecues were going. There's brats cooking everywhere. Everyone's playing this game that has a name that I don't know, uh, where you throw like a sort of a, uh, it's almost like a bean bag uh, into a, a hole. That's oh, a cornhole. Certain... Cornhole. Yeah. <laughs> Every... It's perfect. Everyone's playing cornhole. It's you know, there's music. You hear music uh, drifting along with the smells from the bratwurst, you know, from car to car, and it was. Glorious. You go into the stadium. Uh, it's a day game, so you go into the stadium, and there's the lights coming through the roof uh, in just such a way, and it's so jovial and festive and wonderful, and everybody's having a genuinely good time. Yeah. And they're you know boozing as you do. It's the Milwaukee Brewers. You know mm -hmm. they're named after their they got their mascot is uh, what is it? Bernie Brewer. Bernie Brewer. Yeah. Right. He's a <laughs> he's a beer maker. So the game goes on. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And I go out because I still smoke cigarettes. I go out for a couple of smokes throughout the game. Around the fifth inning, still boisterous, still friendly and family like, but getting a little bit rowdier. I go out for a smoke in the eighth inning, and I am looking at the dregs of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> These people have been drinking hard all fucking day, and they are worn out, and they are tired. And there's, uh, you know, maybe it was just because it was a smoking section, but it was, it was authentic. That's the people I want to see at baseball games. I yes. don't want to see like the like you know super done up pretty people in Anaheim. It's like, come mm, on, guys. Yeah. It's like it's a different, it's a different vibe. I loved it. I absolutely loved it, and. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of me <laughs> sort of wished that I could have been, like, really been there with him, you know, like it was a few years ago, but it's probably best that I wasn't. And uh, I'm sure it was better for the Brewers organization uh, that, that I wasn't uh, drinking that day. 
Right, right. <laughs> Do you have a? Have you been to a bunch of ballparks? I have, yeah. Do you have uh, a favorite other than uh, the yard? Other than Oriole Park, yes. Um, boy, that's that's tough. Uh, I mean, Petco's really was was a lot of fun. Uh, have you been to uh, in San Francisco to the? Uh, I ha- that's the one West Coast Park I haven't been. to. I haven't been to it either. It looks fantastic on the television. Yeah. And all the reports I get from folks are that it is a great place to watch a game. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's small, you're close to the action, the food's good, uh, and they are by and large pretty good fans. Yeah. Uh, which is very, very difficult for me, a Dodger guy, to say. But I will show them that respect because they are the world champions. You know you know what is a <laughs> not a very good stadium, but I love the experience was Oakland. Oh uh, wow. Those those fans are just such decent people. Yeah. Um, and it seems like they, they remind me of Orioles fans just because they've been through so much so many hard times. Yes. Um, I don't like it when fans are fans of a winning team and get cocky. I feel like, for me, I use baseball to sort of uh, gather up my philosophies about life and put them into concrete terms. Uh, and uh, that's, I'm sorry to hear that you're engaged. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm with you. Keep going. Yeah, Keep going. I mean, I, I, it's just like... We're a bromance has friend. started. You know, if my kid is going to be a, a Yankees or Red Sox fan and just think that that's what life has to offer, like, you know, that you're always going to have a winning team and that you expect to win, like... I don't know. I think I'd rather have my kid be a fan of a hard luck team that does well sometimes. And uh, right. that's, I think that's a better life lesson. Absolutely. Because it is not always going to be, uh, you know, uh, sunglasses and autographs. There are, there are, there are peaks and there are valleys. And, 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 and being with a team, uh, well, the, the Yankees, you know, primarily are the perfect example. Who yes. just wins and wins and wins and wins. The Red Sox used to be a good example of a hard luck team. but Right. And now they keep winning and winning oh, and winning. Which is oh, weird. And they, like, you know, I don't know how they're doing it this year. Well, I guess it's pitching and defense, really, and, and scoring more runs than the other yeah, team. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> Those are the three reasons. Yeah. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. Uh, to to be a fan of somebody that a team that has gone, you know, goes through challenges, it builds character, mm-hmm. and that counts for something. For God's yeah. sakes. Uh, when are you guys getting married? Uh, March 29th. Very nice. 2014. Very yeah. very nice. Yeah. Whereabouts? Uh, gonna go to this little place in North uh, LA and West Hills called Orcutt Ranch. Really pretty. Wait, I've heard about that. I think, yeah, that place is gorgeous. Yeah, and it's uh, it's owned by LA City. It's not as expensive as a lot of the other places. I'm doing a little advertisement for them now. As sure. long as you get married after we do, we've already reserved the date, so uh, whatever, everybody else can take it. Um, <laughs> Orchid Ranch. Orchid Ranch, yeah. yeah. And it's like a little uh, orange grove and rose garden Beautiful. and uh, an old mission-style house. It's really nice. Very, very California. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. Is uh, your fiance from California? No, she's New Jersey. So we're both East Coasters. And you guys met out here? Yeah. I love yeah. it. Where'd you guys meet? OK Cupid. Uh, I'm doing more. I better get some free stuff before I'm talking about <laughs> you know, it's, OK Cupid. That's good. I, it's funny. I know I keep meeting more and more people who have found their significant uh, on uh, online in, in that respect. You know, uh, yeah. not, not, a couple from OK Cupid and a few from, um, what's the other one? Uh, Dan? Match.com? <laughs> right, and eHarmony. Yes. Yeah. It's funny how that stuff works out. Well, if, if you're in your 30s and you're working out of your garage like 10 hours a day, like you're not going to meet interesting people <laughs> there. There's people walking by on the street. Or that doesn't go to bars. Like, yeah. it's, and it weeds it out. It's, yeah, you don't it's have so time great. I, I swear just yesterday I had a friend of the show, Percy Carey, MF Grimm, in here, and he said the exact same thing that you said just now, Mac, which, which? was he's meeting more and more people and talking to more and more people that are getting married or have been married for a while that met their significant other online. That's fantastic. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, I, and I you know it's it's, it's funny because you'll you know we'll see in in the media these days so much more coverage of the lousy things that happen online as opposed to the wonderful thing, you know what I mean the the terrible things that can come from the internet as opposed to what we hear now are scores and scores of stories uh, of very positive things that are happening. Yeah. You guys want kids? Uh yeah, I think so. All right? Yeah. I can't wait to be a dad. Yeah. As long as they're not the Yankees. Fan. <laughs> that's classic. Ah, you'll be a disowned. Uh, that's yeah. good. That is that's fun. how my kid's going to rebel against me when they're a teenager. Oh, start no. I love the totally. Yankees. Right. Yeah. They'll, go to, uh, they'll go to Jeter's uh, induction. Actually, <laughs> uh, you Pops. I love the Yankees. Oh, oh, that's my da-dum. nightmare. That's a classic. Um, where do you live now? Uh, Los Feliz. Oh, how do you like it? I really love it. You've there. been there a bit. Yeah, it's. Uh, I actually moved exactly a block away from where I used to live. Okay. Uh, in Los Feliz, but I've lived all over LA now, and um, 
just I really like how walkable it is there. Yeah. Like lots of uh, you know little stores and movie theaters and restaurants and stuff just in walking distance. And sure. um, were yeah. you there before? How long have you been there? Um, I guess going on at either house. Third year. Third year. Los Feliz. Okay, yeah. good. All right. So yeah, there was there was a stretch of time when when Los uh, Feliz was less desirable, oh, sketchy, right. and and yes, is that the word? Yeah. Uh, sketchy, yeah. Uh, and and it seems to have had uh, quite a significant resurgence. And and people are saying the same. I've heard people saying the same thing. Just you're able to walk uh, everywhere. And, yeah. and have a lot of fun. From what I've heard, apparently Los Feliz is turning into the Park Slope of Los Angeles. Ah, huh, interesting. Park I don't know what that slope. means. Park Slope. I guess it's a fancy area in Brooklyn. Oh, oh okay. there's definitely oh, like we have like a, a fancy butcher in the neighborhood where like <laughs> like he was a dandy butcher like his <laughs> yeah, yeah. Monaco is like hello fancy. pizza how <laughs> yeah. what kind of meat would you like today <laughs> <laughs> like that uh yeah I mean I don't know. Um, it's but, an awesome place. There's so much food. Whenever I go to Pete's house to work, we're, there's like just a plethora of food for us to choose from, and it's all really good. Yeah. So. Well, Dan, describe to me food. the uh, describe to me the garage studio. Oh, the garage studio is amazing. If you once the door is closed and you're in it, you, you wouldn't recognize it from any other. I mean, it, it looks like any other stop motion house in town. You know, it, it I feel like garage has a negative connotation, but what Pete's built out in the back of his house at um, <laughs> is amazing. No, no, it's it's really great. He's got all his tools. Um, I was there when he was doing some Baltimore Orioles stuff a few weeks ago, and it's it's amazing. What I mean, it's of... it's giant. I, I won't give it enough justice, but, um, yeah, I mean, I wanted to get into, like, Pete built that puppet that's in the foreground. Well, let's talk about this puppet in and the foreground. it's amazing well, and beautiful, this and was, I want to know was, how he made this it. This was for the movie that was, uh, or the this the piece that he was shooting when you visited? Yeah, and that goes up at the Orioles Stadium. That's amazing. I Wait. should I should point out that I did not actually build that oh. puppet. I animated him. Um, I built know. the first Oriole puppet that we used. This one's built by a much better puppet fabricator, John Sumner. Um and uh, who's also a very very nice person. Does it does the Oriole bird uh, mascot have a name? He's called the bird. Oh, of course the yeah, bird. Oh, yeah. and you said that. That's right. I did. Um, um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I built the the foam finger and the little pennant though. I'm very proud of those. Yeah, those are fantastic. Oh, they look like you. they you know they look exactly like a foam finger and pennant. Yeah. <laughs> what uh, what uh, so there's is there there's an animation that goes up at the stadium? Yeah, it's on the jumbotron. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> right? How so cool exciting. is that? How cool is that? I mean, amazing. Yeah, it's not like. It's not the job that pays the most, but it's like the best for bragging rights. Are you kidding? Of course it is. My my brother-in-law actually composed uh, the song that is played when they release the Raven, uh, oh, the live cool. Raven at the Ravens game. Oh wow! So oh, it's I mean, but it's the same sort of thing. It's like you know, yeah. uh, millions of people identify and they know that song. It's like a so the same thing. What uh, what what happens in the in the uh, in the piece? Um, what do they see on the jumbotron that you made in a garage in Los well, Angeles? Well, let's see. This one. Uh, He's uh their their big thing that they really like the animation for is the uh, let's go O's chant. Perfect. Um, and so the first one I did for them this year was him chanting let's go O's, and as he gets to each word, um, or he doesn't chant it, he claps and stomps along. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a good bird should. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there's three crabs that spin around and hold up signs that say let's go and O's. Perfect. Um. And then I had another one where he's on a jet pack and is flying into the air to catch a uh, uh, ball that would have been a home run. Right, perfect. Um, and then what else did I do this year? Oh, there's one where he's in front of like a noise o meter that measures oh, how to help loud them. the fans yeah, are Yeah, so it makes some noise. Yeah, yeah. makes some noise. That one always rubs me a little funny sometimes. And, and I will say this, Orioles fans. For all the experiences that I've had at Oriole Park and Camden Yards, they know what's going on. Yes. Which, uh, which to me means that when it's time to make some noise, they're already making some noise. <laughs> and when the noise meter comes up, it just amps it up. A I feel bit like more. you can use it strategically. It's it's when it's overused by stadiums. And some stadiums, I won't name them. Uh huh. Um, I'm familiar. Anaheim. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they overuse the make some noise, turn it up. I mean, you have to use it in like very specific situations and exactly. very specific points. I think you never use it before, like, say, the sixth inning. Uh, agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Unless, well, I mean, I guess the, 
Uh, yeah, you know, even with the bases loaded in the third, it's still a little early. And if the fans are paying attention, they should be making some noise anyway. That being said, if the Anaheim Angels want to hire me to do some animation for them, <laughs> oh, that's true. Uh, they don't want to alienate them. Angel. What oh, would boy. you make? Is it, would you do? I guess you could make an animated rally monkey. Monkey, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Right. I really want to do. I mean, the Orioles one is near near and dear to my heart because I love them so much. Um, but I have I have thought about like what if I could do other teams? I would love to do an animated Dodger dog. Oh, uh, perfect! I think that would be amazing. Absolutely. Can you talk um, about the Orioles uh, animation that they wouldn't let you put up? Oh yeah, I mean it it wasn't nothing. It wasn't anything bad. I mean you don't see the Oriole birds junk or anything. Um, <laughs> I love that. It's just him uh, beating out the beat for Let's Go O's with baseball bats on Yankee players' heads. Oh, I see. And the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, uh, the implied violence, well, the actual violence. Yeah, violence. I, I guess that, is that, that you know, the thing at Dodger Stadium with the guy getting beaten outside Brian the stadium Stowe. happened pretty recently. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, they were a little bit nervous about putting that one up. And yeah, I, don't, sure. I don't blame them. I, you know, the thing is, I didn't run that idea past them. Um, it was more just me getting really excited about the Orioles. And, and going from the heart. Well, yeah. It's also, it's a, there's a very interesting thing that takes place, and I imagine it's less so now. Uh, in the past couple of years, the O's have been playing very, very well, and uh, the stadium is fuller. But uh, what would happen, I was working as a waiter at, at the One World for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it seemed like during the summer, you know, <clears throat> um, I would suddenly be serving a ton of Yankee fans, mm -hmm. you know, uh, all dressed in gear and ready to go down to the game, or a ton of Red Sox fans, you know, yeah. uh, ready to go down to the game. And so the, the stands would be, would be, you know, filled, not filled, but, you know, maybe like a, I don't know, I'd say 70-30. Uh, kind of ratio where you have fans from the other, you know, because the East Coast is so much, you know, the towns are so much closer right. together. They could just drive down and yeah. Fenway South, I think yeah. they called it. Oh, I hate that. <clears throat> Which that, is that that to me is like the most upsetting thing about agreed. being an Orioles fan is just the fans of the Yankees and Red Sox invading and coming taking down. Over. And yeah. here's the thing: it's like when I go to San Diego or Anaheim. I know I've been bad mouthing Anaheim right. baseball a little bit, um, but. I try to be a good guest. I try sure. to be a representative for my team and my city's culture and that, things like that, you know? Right. Um, so, I don't know. I just I feel like you can't come dressed in the opposing color and boo the home team. Agreed. It's just, it's, it's, it's asking a faux pas. Isn't, isn't it's that asking for the trouble. point, though, of baseball fans? I mean, I, I, mean not the... I guess so, but I, I, you know. I mean, it's what you make of it. I, I like going up to Oakland and having good conversations with their fans about, like, our thoughts on Miguel Tejada since mm -hmm. he played for both teams. Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, uh, I had conversations with uh, the, some of the Padres fans about what it's like for when the team changes their colors and their whole, like, design aesthetic and, like, how do they deal with that. And, like, you know, it was, it, these are, like, good conversations and they're, you know, trying to see something through the other fans' eyes and instead of just, like, coming in there and, like... Just being cocky and a dick and like yeah, which uh, and I don't think I'm going to be saying anything here that is not uh, you know I'm not breaking any news, uh, but it seems as though the Yankee and or Red Sox fans have uh, well a bit of the market cornered on cocky of not right. <laughs> <laughs> you know there's there's a lot of that uh, there's a lot of that um, machismo. Uh, that, right. that comes along, especially if you're going to be, you know, either uh, spending a couple hundred bucks in gas or, you know, sixty bucks in the train ticket to go down and see your team play in somebody else's stadium, you know. <clears throat> yeah, as, and, as and that's team. why I think like what's happening with the Yankees right now, where there's the whole deal with A Rod and the mm -hmm. team's not doing very well. Mm -hmm. The Yankees fans growing up now are probably going to have a better life lesson when they do well again. Absolutely. You know, like the the Yankees Absolutely. fans who rooted for Don Mattingly in the '80s, I feel. I'm sorry, I'm making big generalizations. I'm probably going to alienate some of the audience. But, uh, you know, I feel like the Yankees fans who rooted for the Yankees from the Don Mattingly time period um, have a better understanding of the human condition and experience than just the Yankees fans who were there only when they were doing well. I, I could not agree with you more. I, I will ask uh, this. Are you familiar at all with uh, George Carlin's routine on baseball and football? Yes, yeah. It is a spectacular stacking of words and phrases that have to do with describing both baseball and football. It is, it is unbelievable. It will blow your mind if you are a fan of one or both, but it, it particularly, from my perspective, a, a fan of uh, baseball. And I think it says something about the kind of fandom that you're talking about. Baseball fans, I think, tend to be, hopefully, a little more seasoned uh, and uh, or, hmm, oh, gosh. 
I always say this without getting in trouble, cultured, mm. you know, less likely to uh, to want to uh, smash somebody about the head and face, which is why that thing in uh, Dodger Stadium was such an anomaly, uh, right. and I'm sure alcohol had plenty to do with that. <laughs> totally forgot what my point was, other than George Carlin is really funny. <laughs> you won't get an argument from me. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. What would the Dodger dog be doing? Oh, gosh. I You know, <laughs> what would the Dodger dog be doing? I mean, the first thing that pops to mind is, like, well, of course, running the bases, but I, sure. I sort of feel like, I don't know, maybe having him uh, do some dance moves. I, I got I got maybe an idea. Okay. It would it goes, it takes, it with the, the Dodgers are the Dodgers, as I'm sure you know, uh, because of Brooklyn. Charlie Dodgers. That's right. They were. Formerly the uh, Brooklyn Bridegrooms. Yes, and the Robins before oh, that. Oh, yeah, yes, very yes, nice. The Robins, yeah. the Bridegrooms, then the Trolley Dodgers, and yes. then shortened to just Dodgers. But I suppose you can have a Dodger dog dodging a trolley. Mm, there and you the, go. the trolley on the side of it could be like, you know, like triple or... Right. I don't know. Something like that. Or I was going to think maybe you can advertise for the LA Metro, which oh, could, could yeah. use all the publicity, <laughs> all the good publicity yeah. it could get. That's so funny. <clears throat> um, are you familiar at all with a television show called Inside the Actor's Studio? I, I am, yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I, I've, I've watched the uh, Will Ferrell version of it. On oh, that's a very good, one. very good one. <laughs> that is probably the best one. Uh, <clears throat> at the end of the show, oh boy, <clears throat> uh, James Lipton, who is a lovely uh, and talented uh, man, uh, he will ask the questionnaire that he borrowed from Bernard Pivot. As we uh, come to the end of uh, of of Das process, uh, it's the end already. Well, we're ne we're ne are we? Am I? Is it too early? Did I go to the car too early? I think where are we at about fifty minutes right now? You are correct, sir. We just start. It talking. just flies by. And invite me back for your your marathon stop. fundraiser show because I'm, I'm having fun talking. <laughs> Wait a minute. Should we talk a little bit more about I'm scared the movie? We could. I mean, what can, I'm not what, opposed what, to. What it? can we, as as the director of I'm Scared the movie, what yes. do you, what can we expect? What can we look oh, for? What well, can we hope for? Yeah, I guess. Um, what can we pay for? Yeah, <laughs> all well, of it. <laughs> I mean, first and foremost is Griggs' artwork, and I think that's really the reason why we want to do this is bringing his artwork into the animated world. Um, but on top of that, it's a you know, it's a fun story. It's a uh, Something that uh, he wrote, and then Dan and I kind of came in and were like, "Oh, what if we tweak this and this?" And we all kind of worked together as a team, like um, finding the best way for it to work as a short film. Um, it's uh, everything's in kind of Dr. Seuss style rhymes. Beautiful. Um, and uh, it's got some just really, uh, I don't know, just cool ideas for things that kids are scared of in the middle of the night. Oh, that's perfect. Um, and uh, what we're hoping is that if we're able to do this one, um, it could kind of start the ball rolling on bringing other artists into this. Right, not just uh, the illustrious uh, Greg Simpkins, but also um, some other folks that uh, that are uh, you know equally talented and have a different kind of uh, style. Yeah, and, and um, you know, I mean, we'd love to work with other established artists. We've had a couple people that we've reached out to or who've reached out to us. Um, we'd love to work with you know, eventually if, if we can get C4 Films to be sort of a brand mm -hmm. um, and this kind of contemporary artist animation film uh, as something that's ongoing, we'd love to bring in maybe less established artists wow. and have them get, get them like, a, a little chance to, to shine as well. Because there's a, I mean, I don't know, just being in L.A., you're just humbled and surrounded by amazing artwork all the time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just like, I think Dan and I just both, get really excited with the possibilities Very. of all the different collaborations that could be possible. Um, and, you know, it's it's an honor for us to get to work with Greg. I mean, he's pretty brilliant. He really um, is. Yeah. He's, I mean, it's it's some of the, the work that I've seen of his is absolutely breathtaking. And yeah. amazing how humble and awesome that dude is. It's yeah. beyond wonderful working with him. That's good. Yeah. This may be a Dan question, actually. What do you think is the is 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 the most exciting offer and or value on the Kickstarter page? Mm. Ooh, that's a hard one. I, I say we both answer um, on three. <laughs> one, two, as loud as you can. Um, I mean, without looking at the Kickstarter page, there's such original art on there that um, he's going to do like he's doing. To we have a, um, a a pledge tier called That's Sick. Yo, that's sick. And it's um, he's gonna custom, uh, he's gonna draw on custom uh, two air sickness bags. Oh wow! And they're gonna be the only two in existence he will ever do. 
So nice. I mean, is... there's that. There's I think they're all gone, but there's a there was a pledge level where you could have him write up to 25 or 30 characters of your choosing. Wow! For a nominal fee compared to what he does, and there's a big one that's still up there that I'm hoping someone grabs onto. I, I would imagine it'd be like a record company or a, an animation house, some somebody that would really like it. It's ten thousand dollars, but if you compare that to what the man gets usually, right for regular commission. Yeah, well. I mean. It's it, it's a wall mural. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a it's a graffiti wall mural. I mean, it's people pay a large chunks of money for this kind of thing. So the opportunities that we've put on Kickstarter for people to have just because we want to see this come to fruition, um, the art prices are all lower, you know, than you would find in a gallery, and you know we had to keep them reasonably in balance for his collectors because, you know, a lot of people have paid a lot of big money for it, so we don't want to upset collectors sure. because they're a big part of our fan base as well. Naturally. But we wanted to also have an opportunity for collectors to get something. There's, oh, there's, like, really neat things like a used paintbrush, and it's not like we're going to send you one used paintbrush in a, you know, paper sack. <laughs> right. You're going to get a really nice presentation of Greg's. For me, and this is what I said, going back to the baseball thing, I'm not a huge sports fan. I like going to live events, but if I was a baseball fan, I, when, and I was as a, as a kid, I collected bats or balls, autographed balls. This is that. This is that for right. an artist. And not only that, a game a game used one, yeah. which, ding, which, ding, is, ding, ding, which ding. is where the yep. real, real value comes. Yep. Not only, uh, you know, God, my, uh, my neighbor, uh, somehow, I think his uncle was uh, 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 played in the majors for a little bit and ended up with, uh, with an Ozzy Smith game news wow. I had my hand on it this morning wow and the value there is incredible so for uh, for for fans of modern art, modern art is that a fair way to say it uh, yeah contemporary art for pop surrealism there's so many names fans for of it. contemporary art and pop surrealism uh, having a, a piece of Crayola's equipment uh, would be pretty right pretty pretty good I think it's pretty awesome all right and is there uh, is there one that stands out to you Pete um, well one of them it went really early was the uh, the art lessons from Greg oh, uh, yeah uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. it's a shame that we couldn't do more of those, but uh, I think that'll be really good. We do have now, um, you can have lunch with me and Greg and Dan and have a tour of the studio where we're shooting. That's fantastic. And some of those sold, which is crazy. Yeah, well, people that's... actually want to meet us and hang out. But I, <laughs> well, I think that'd I can, be fun. I can tell people if uh, they are some of the people who actually do want to meet you, you're going to be uh, satisfied. This is, a, <laughs> this is a good pairing of, of, of folks. I know them all. And, and we I have like... good places, in, and we have good taste in places to eat, too. True, yeah. true, true. It'll be a good meal. That's good. We, uh, what do you got, Dan? We actually have a caller, a fan of the show, that has a question for Pete. Pete, oh. you're going to have to put your headphones on for this. Okay. Here but we go. We, we have a caller, Candace in North Carolina. Candace, can you hear us? Yeah. Hi. Welcome to the show. How are you? So, I'm all right. Well, I'm so excited. We have a fan of I'm Scared. And you have a question for Pete, our director? Maybe. Uh, can, can, so, so uh, you have a question oh. for Pete, our director? I think you have to talk into the phone there. Candace in North Carolina? Oh. Uh, speaker. Bum, 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 bum. Well, it was plugged in. Uh, hey, Candace, can you hear us? Barely. Okay, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Uh, Perfect. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I hope you're not hearing too much feedback. This is Pete. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you had a question? Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> Did you have a question? <laughs> yes, I just wanted to have you talk more about the overall look of the film and the inspiration behind it. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Um, basically, uh, I guess the the look is we're going to try to capture Greg's artwork as, as much as possible uh, in the look of this. And uh, I think uh, for us, the, the puppets are really going to be the focus of this. Um, we want to spend as much time on the design of them to translate it into 3D. Uh, as 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 we can, and um, let's see. I'm trying to think about the uh, what what was it the the look and the process or 
Yeah, yeah it was the, the look and the influence. Oh, yeah. the influence. Yeah. Um, you know, I think for us, we want to also uh, emphasize that it is stop motion. We're not going to try to pretend that it's CG, and uh, so we want to try to work in some cool textures. Um, and I think uh, you know, as smooth as we can get the animation, we'd love to do that, but also keeping it in the realm of you can look at it and know that it's stop motion. You can know that you can touch these items and wow, neat. yeah, you, you they, they'll they'll feel real. They'll feel like it's a it's a real physical thing in front of you. Um, I know there's been a lot of big budget uh, movies where it's it's hard to even tell it's stop motion. Right. And I, I think it it helps the craft to sort of go with the limitations and use those limitations as strength. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. No, that's or not. beautifully put, though. Yeah, unfortunately, I think we lost the call, but it was Can a good still question. Can she hear us if she's listening? Yeah, she's like, watching in Candace, North Carolina. Thank you for 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 uh, for calling. Uh, thank, you. thank you for watching. Yeah, thank that you was so awesome. Much. Yeah, calling. it was a perfect question. <laughs> that was cool. Please enjoy uh, the Tar Heel State for us, <laughs> in our stead. Is that right, the Tar Heel State? Yeah. Oh, I hope that's right. I believe oh, so. Man, I think I just lost a listener. <sighs> <sighs> Terrible. Oh. Candace, forgive Mac, please. Oh my god, I don't know, I mean, is there anything else we should touch on on the Kickstarter? It's all such an amazing journey, like, the, this whole crowdfunding thing, and everything that's going on with it is just so exciting, and I think, like, we, we hit the right time for it. Well, let me talk a little bit about the process, actually. Oh, Perfect. yeah, um, that'd be a great show for it. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, basically, with stop motion, I mean, we're looking to shoot maybe six to eight seconds a day, um... A lot of times, you know, for TV, you're shooting 10 to 12 seconds a day. We'd like to, to take our time with this as much as possible um, and get really specific movements for each creature, each sort of nightmarish thing. We'll move in a different way. We're like, even if they're just on screen briefly, you can tell a little bit about their personality from mm -hmm. the way they lumber in or they, like, swerve in or whatever. Nice. Um, and then we'd like to get some real character into the two little kids. They're going to be the stars. And... Uh, you know, it's, it's basically like when you animate, it's like you're acting in slow motion. Hmm. Um, and, I mean, I never thought I would be an actor, but I feel like a, a certain kinship with actors now because, you know, when someone's directing an animator, you direct them the same way, a character animator, you direct them the same way you direct an actor. Right. right. Um, now, from, I don't mean to cut you off, but, like, mm -hmm. from what I got to observe Robot Chicken, more oral while working with you, because I was never an animator. I was on the production side. I did a lot of producing. In a very animated fashion, I would say. <laughs> always. <laughs> always. <laughs> but what I observed is, like, for, for Robot Chicken, or even for more oral, take either one. You're going to have the writing process, the script gets done. Then, um, I, you know, I'd watch all this progress. Uh, the voice records, so you get the acting out of the actor in the voice records, and then you actually are getting a second actor out of the animator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because mm -hmm. absolutely. You're, exactly, you're building on the voice record. Exactly. Exactly yeah. what Pete is saying is you are getting a piece of Pete in each animation, and I, there were how many stages on Robot and Moral? Uh, maybe like I don't know, 13 going at once? So I, I would fluctuate and, you know, spend a, a little time with each animator, more with my friends. And, um, <laughs> you know, you at the end of the week when we would watch the weeklies and what had been produced, you can see the physical traits and emotions and qualities Coming of the through? person right through there. Wow. You, can, you can watch and you can pick out different movements that if you know the animator well enough, you're like, oh, yeah, Pete always, like, you know, does this or, you know, like, walks that way with that certain gait or whatever. Yeah. That's you know. wild, and if I would imagine if it's a, if it's a, you know a different person than, than the voice actor, you're adding another layer of nuance into that character. You know, yeah. you're, you're making uh, you know what the what the audience will see have at least another layer underneath, which I think is is actually kind of um, beautiful in that you're able to combine both the energy of the voice actor and the energy of the animator into something that is its own standalone energy. Yeah, you know, which is neat. I think. I mean, for me, getting back to baseball, uh, the process of stop motion <laughs> feels like a baseball team. You know, everybody gets their time. The the animators, you know, each have, like, their time alone when they're doing their thing and they're in the spotlight. But then you're also a bigger team outside of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you and, know... And, and, you, and you have a common goal. You have a common goal. Right. And, and, and it's great. I mean, everybody does a piece of the storytelling. You know, the sculpts or the puppet tell part of the story. Mm -hmm. The lighting tells the story. The, uh, the camera composition, everything, you know, goes into it. I mean, it's the same for any kind of filmmaking, but I think 
because you control so much on such a uh, very anal retentive Micro scale level. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just a uh, you know, if we have the budget and the time that we want with this project, we can really uh, control it down to a you know the smallest uh, details. Beautiful, Dan. Dan, what do you got to report? This is a very very exciting episode of DOS Process. Well, first of all, we had talked earlier about uh, future artists that we're working with. Well, I feel I'm fairly sure I can say that uh, two of them are Brant Peters and Kathy Olivier. And Kathy Olivas. Yes. Kathy Olivas. Oh my God, Kathy! I'm so sorry. I've <laughs> known her over ten years, and I can never get, get her that name right. Let's just go back to the beginning of the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, we're, Brant Peters, we're going to get him on the phone right now, and I'd like to just share with everybody the next uh, one of the next artists we're going to have on. What's going on, Dan? This is Brant Peters, amazing, amazing artist. He he had something to tell Pete in specific. So oh wow! I said, let's let's get you on the phone. Brant Peters, how are you, sir? Good, good, good. It sounds like you have me on speakerphone, so all the rest of the world can hear me. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you're you're live on YouTube, my friends. How you doing, Brant? This is Pete. Good, good. Things, things, are, things are good. I took a little time off to, uh, to go see uh, Kick-Ass 2 and just came back, and now I'm about to draw for the next uh, six hours and do turnarounds and stuff for some projects. Oh, cool, cool. Yeehaw! So uh, we're just talking. I'm scared, and you know, uh, our next project with you and your wife. We thought maybe you wanted to chime in. Sure, that sounds good. Yes, okay, I'll chime in. Uh, what would you like to? What would you like me to say? Anything you'd like, <laughs> sir. Anything you'd like. Are you, I mean, I'm excited to be working with you, uh, Pete, and I went down to San Diego. I thought we had an excellent meeting, and I'm just really excited. I'm. Curious to know how excited you are. I think I are absolutely completely. We're um we are actually we're probably maybe one more rewrite away from turning in the treatment to you guys for final review. We are we're already starting to figure out uh, designs and uh, and scenes and environments and just different things we could throw your way if you got to get some feedback from you guys. And this is this has been a long time in the making. Um, we've been approached by other uh, major studios before, but we didn't, you know, we didn't really sort of knew, we didn't know what we were doing, in essence, and we just kind of held a lot of people off for the longest time, and then finally, by the time we were ready to start actually pitching our world and our universe, which seems to be the next level for our fan base, um, that it was just sort of kismet, like, basically, that's you literally sort of texted me the day, and that we were actually going to start scheduling pitch meetings and stuff like that. So it was the time was absolutely perfect. And uh, and we've known each other for such a long time we're finally just really awesome that we're stuck in the other at the point. Yeah, you know, I, I uh, talking about uh, you know collaborations. You know, meeting with you and Mikey, uh, who's who's going to be helping with the writing uh, or doing the writing, I guess, uh, uh, in San Diego. That was just you know, it just it felt like this sort of instant chemistry. I'd I'd never met you guys before, and uh, you know, it was just like we got together at this little like street side cafe, and all of a sudden, like the ideas were flowing, and it was just. I think that's what has me and Dan most excited about this is just like being able to work with people whose artwork we love and respect and you know it's just it's it's a it's a really cool exciting project and uh, I, I can't wait to get going on it. We're, I, I really appreciate that. We felt the same way after we left. I mean uh, that's what I was saying towards the end of that meeting that typically like you know really early on if a meeting is going in the right direction. And it just, it, you know, honestly, just the time just flew by. We had, I had no idea that we were, we were there for like, I think, a couple hours. Like, yeah. Um, it was great. No, no, we're, we're, we're so excited to work with you guys. We're just sort of chomping at the bit. We can't wait. And uh, we have some, a lot of really awesome stuff in store for you guys. Ah, oh, can't wait. I, I'm so excited. So excited. Well, it was great talking with you, Brand. I'm so, like, so happy that we caught you. And um, this will be going up soon in support of both Greg's, uh, the movie we're working on now, and our project together. So thank you for calling in, man. Thank you so much. Oh, no problem. No problem. You guys have a good one. I'll talk to you soon. And, uh, yeah, take care.
You too. Have a good Take afternoon. Care, Give Kathy our love, all right? Thank you. All right, see you, Brent. Later. I tell you, that guy gets huge, huge props from me because it's one thing to uh, have, uh, answer a call and then be on the speakerphone with a few people uh, in the room. It's it's another thing to uh, pick up the phone and be on, uh, you know, live, if you will, <laughs> on, the YouTube. uh, on the YouTubes. Uh, he, he and had, that, I mean, that was yeah. handled. He handled yeah. it that really handled. well. That's a professional right there. I, uh, he texted and was like, I'm watching, it's great. I was like, oh, you should call in. He's like, I'd love to. Perfect. So. Okay, so he, he knew what he, he was getting into. I think a little bit, right. but <laughs> again, one once again, Brant, thank you so much. That was awesome. That's Brant Peters and Kathy Olivas. Yes. And yes. they're both they're husband and wife, but they work. Um, they each do their own thing. Uh, and our goal for the next project is to bring those worlds together, which has never been done. And and one thing that's really nice. Um, well, the, the worlds have come together in paintings before, but never but never, never on camera. Correct. Um, and uh, one thing that's really nice is all these different artists, uh, Greg and Brant and Kathy. And uh, several of the other ones we're talking to, they each have such a particular style. Uh, Phil Lumbang. Phil Lumbang. Oh, Phil, from, sure. He yeah. was on the show. Love Phil. Love Phil. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's great because, uh, you know, as an animator, talking about uh, acting, I mean, you get to be sort of a chameleon mm -hmm. and, and take on the style of this artist that, you know, it's just like, it's it's a treat. You know, it's like, it's like um, you know, if you're, if you're acting in something for live action, it means, like, you know, play a role of somebody where like you you're just really into that character. Right. Yeah. It's good. It's good. You can contribute. You can I don't know, you can you can pour all of yourself into it. And um, I, the thing that I think is fascinating, as I mentioned earlier about um, the animation, is that you you can get all of a lot of people into something, yeah. you know. And there's a lot of there's a lot of impact uh, there, which is good. So, folks, if you have not checked out the Kickstarter page, I would do so immediately. Yeah, even if you don't have a ton of money to give, even if you have no money to give, just just show two people. That's all we're asking. I'm not, you know, it's not about the money. It's about the love, the support, and making something beautiful for the world. And, um, you know, every little bit counts. So it's really not about your donation amount. Just please support and, you know, you tell two friends, they tell two friends. And the next thing you know, <laughs> the country is out. Yes. <laughs> Update from uh, from Candace in North Carolina. Well, she you said say? that there is a terrible thunderstorm. Uh -huh. um, so that may have caused her phone. Uh, and she says, Mac, you're absolutely forgiven. She, the answer to her question was perfect. She's so stoked about the project. And uh, don't worry about North Carolina. She's from Florida. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go Candace brilliant. in North Carolina once again brilliant. thank you absolutely brilliant yeah thanks Candace um, enjoy the storm <laughs> so it's what you know. It's something we don't really get out here in uh, Southern California. It's one of the things I miss from the East Coast. Yeah, actually. Yeah. 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 yeah, a nice, a nice little storm every once in a while. It's uh, it's good for the soul. It is good cleansing. For the soul. Cleansing. All right. He's going to the questions, Pete. But Mr. you want to know why? Ask him why. Oh no no no! no. What? What? Oh, really, no okay. I can't. Uh, Mac I has really, a story I about. But it's such a. Oh, there's honestly, a story? Well, it's, yes, it's, there is. There's a story, but it's not. I mean, it's really. I think my wife has to get to FedEx, and I think they're closing at six. So oh boy! Honestly, I apologize about this because yeah, yeah, we got yeah. one car, and I got it. So I got to get the car back to the. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All right. Well, yeah. he got out of that one really good. No, but I'm serious. I apologize. Okay. okay. I can I, can I put that. in one more quick plug? Yes, please. Uh, it's not for the Kickstarter. I have a couch on Craigslist free right now. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's looking for kind of a slightly dirty couch with some rips in the cushions, it's it's very comfortable. You could just put a blank on top of it. You won't see the rips. That is why uh, I love the man. <laughs> so Los good. Angeles, Craigslist free. Look for the white couch. <laughs> that one's mine. Uh, and, you know, um, I think uh, uh, if you're a Greg Simpkins fan, he's, he's probably sat on it once. So oh, there you go. How about that? Yeah. That's worth something. Yeah. Pete Levin. What is your favorite word? Oh, boy. Um, my favorite word. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, it's, um, oh, wait. I, I have this. Um, Hinosoronche. Wow. It's the Portuguese version of, rhino of rhinoceros. Say it again. Hinosoronche. Oh, my God. Nice. That is an incredible word. I love it. Hinosoronche. I was down in Brazil working on a movie down there, and um, I just kept on saying Hinosoronche. <laughs> Everybody in there like, why does he keep talking about rhinoceros? <laughs> it's the rhinoceros guy again. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> what is your least favorite word? Oh, um, modernity. Ooh, I hate modernity. It sounds like maternity, but with a soft middle to it, and I just... Ugh, it's, I don't know. I don't what, like what, it. What does that mean? It means modernness. Yes, something, something Ma that has... Oh, modernity. I just don't like the way it sounds. It doesn't flow from the mouth very well. I see. Wow, that. perfectly put. A wordsmith. <laughs> what turns you on? 
Oh boy. Creatively, spiritually, ah, and uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, I guess uh, the the I love the very beginning of a project for before you get to the, the nitty gritty of it, where you're just like so amped about it, and then I love the very end of the project where you're like, oh my gosh, look what I just helped make. Beautiful. Uh, Beautiful. Yeah, yeah those uh, the moments of uh, conception and uh, completion. Yeah, and the middle of the project's okay too, but you know, there's a lot of like nitty gritty you got to get down right, to. Right, right. But, but the, the power of the energy at the beginning of the end there is yeah. valuable. Valuable. What turns you off? Oh, boy. Uh, I think cockiness. Mm -hmm. We're talking about cockiness. I have less and less patience the older I get with, with cockiness. I get that. Yeah. I get that. And, I, and I'm saying that, you know, cockily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Um, oh, boy. Um, the, the meow of a gentle kitten. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Who doesn't like that? Oh. Come on. I can't believe this guy's already spoken <laughs> for. <before. laughs> what sound or noise do you hate? Oh, the meow of a cocky kitten. <laughs> ah, fucking jerk. <laughs> what I, have I just I just tried to, by the way, can I just say I just tried not to say asshole and I said fucking instead. <laughs> That's perfect. No, you cleaned it right up. Yeah. Uh, what which brings us to uh it's funny, the naturally the progression there. What's your favorite curse word? Oh, um mm, mm, mm. um I I will often say if I'm really upset uh, Jesus, fuck! Wow. Um, I'm sorry to all of my Christian friends and relatives <laughs> no, 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 right no, no. now. That's, there's um, fine. There's you know because honestly they're based in forgiveness. Yeah. So yeah, I, well, I hope so. I mean, that's the idea, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's be a Jesus fuck is strong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I get it. I get it. I mean, it's two very powerful words combined uh, without a breath. Yeah, and it didn't. It's not something conscious. It's just sort of like I was trying to say Jesus Christ, and I also like just it was big enough. I wanted to drop the f bomb as well. Boom. Yeah. Came right out. Yeah. Strong. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Ooh. Um. Hmm, is it too late for me to get into baseball? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. What are you doing later? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I was sure that I was gonna make it, and then, uh, and then, I, and then I didn't. I, I know the feeling. <laughs> what profession would you not like to do? Oh boy. Um, you know, I think just I get I get antsy if I'm at like a single job for more than the run of an average, you know, television production or whatever. So. I think if I were stuck in like a, a cubicle job for yeah you know no offense to the people that have cubicle jobs I know that there's some hey, some great people ones are out there. built for it you yeah know? yeah I get just, it done and they're good at it I get antsy yeah fair enough you're entitled here I, I'm addicted to that excitement of the beginning and the end of a project you know I mean seriously if I go without that for too long it's like you know you start you start like, like atrophy jonesing for it yeah. yeah yeah and question number ten the big question oh boy if Heaven exists. Uh -huh. What would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Well, I hope it's not anything about my my curse word I just used. <laughs> um, <laughs> what would I want him to say? I want him to say uh, uh, maybe uh, you're not you're not like an A Rod fan, are you? Okay, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Absolutely perfect. You can follow Pete Levin at, at Pete Levin on the uh, on the Twitter there, and uh, be sure to check out the Kickstarter page for um, I'm Scared the Movie. Uh, it's something that is uh, well, it's certainly exciting um, now that it's at the beginning. I know it's going to be a lot of work in the middle, and uh, the completion of which will be uh, a great deal of excitement as well. Pete, you've been a wonderful guest. I'm Thank thrilled so to have uh, had you here, and I'm uh, sure we're going to have you back. Uh, Thank before you. before long, to. maybe during uh, the World Series when the O's and Dodgers are playing. Oh, I would love that. We can have a completely rematch. baseball oh, so centric excited. episode. So excited. Yeah, My, for a change. For a change. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Mac Aston. I've been Dan Levy. I'm Colin Crump. Mike Fasolo. And I'm Pete. You've been listening to Das Process. Thank you guys all for stopping by and uh, don't forget the Alamo. <laughs>